Hey everybody, welcome back. So if you've been looking at this particular playlist on my channel, you'll see that it, the name changed. It had, been, it had originally been called Screw the Whiffs. That was because that was the name of the book that I was working on. And as I'm in the middle of writing it, I decided to change the name. Um, I had a lot of good feedback that Screw the Whiffs just wasn't quite capturing exactly what I wanted to get at. It, it certainly captured the whiffs. And what I mean by whiffs are all the what ifs, all the intrusive thoughts, all the excessive worrying, but it didn't capture the rest of what I'm trying to talk about um, in the book. And, and so the book is going to be called Here's the Deal. Deal is my acronym that I'll go over here in a second. But I wanted to open it up. And I think this title captures more of what I'm trying to say because it's really looking at all forms of nervous system sensitization, nervous system suffering, anxious suffering, disordered anxiety, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that is everything from intrusive thoughts and excessive worry and rumination um, to panic, to DPDR, depersonalization, derealization, um, to physical feelings of, you know, whether it's dizziness, feeling faint, physical pain, tinnitus, blurry vision, um, lump in your throat, you know, all of those, you know, physical signs that, you know, that can be really debilitating, stomach issues, um, all, all the systems. Again, when we're dealing with a nervous system, we're dealing with all systems go um, in terms of what, what it can attack and what it can attach to. So here's the deal is, is, is I think a little bit more, um, casts a wider net and allows me to kind of speak about the acronym that I've come up with over the last many years as I did a deep dive into the world of nervous system sensitization, whether, and, and again, on this channel, you'll see a, a whole playlist that's designed for people that are, um, have kind of entered this realm due to medication injury or adverse effects. And that's my benzodiazepine withdrawal playlist. There's like 260 videos on there. And that's for people who are going through either adverse reactions or withdrawal discontinuation syndromes that are complicated on anything from benzodiazepines to other psychotropic medications um, and other meds, even things like gabapentin and um, pregabalin, things like that. So that would be, you know, for those folks, this is a, probably more of a broad stroke for, again, anybody dealing with panic, DPDR, intrusive thoughts, um, excessive fear, excessive worrying, sticky brain, um, and I really get into the sensitization piece. And my book is, you know, these videos kind of come off my book. Um, it won't, it won't, it won't speak to the book word for word by any means, but it'll capture some of the more salient points. So let's just get to what I mean by deal. I do talk about this acronym on my other playlist for the, for the med injured folks. Um, but I want to speak about it here. And it really, you know, is, you know, a little bit of kind of, you know, um, old wine and new bottles. I'll, I'll own that. Um, because it's, it's really what I came up with after I did a deep dive in studying into the world of Claire Weeks. If you've probably heard me talk about Claire Weeks, if not, my gosh, please go check her out. She was the matriarch basically of the mind body connection. She was writing about the nervous system back in the sixties and really is the matriarch of what we would consider disordered anxiety and the co contemporary treatment for, for disordered anxiety whether again that's panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or social anxiety disorder, depersonalization, derealization, even OCD, all of those things. So DEAL stands for, it's, a, it's, it's, it's an acronym, and it stands for Decide, Evoke, Allow, and Live. And I came up with this because I wanted to come up with something for my own journey, and then also as I work with people um, in various phases of either a complicated medication withdrawal, or just in simply dealing with, you know, disordered anxiety that's really taking them away from their lives and their livelihood. And, you know, again, um, there's there's other people out there writing about disordered anxiety who've got some great acronyms and, and great use. This one just seemed to make the most sense to me. And so it was kind of a culmination of everything I've studied. And again, you'll hear me talk about the people that have really shaped me in this, being Claire Weeks, and then finding more contemporary people like Martin Seif and Sally Winston and Reed Wilson, um, and then even more contemporary, Josh Fletcher, uh, Drew Linsalata, Jenna Overbaugh. I've, I've really done a deep dive and kind of come up with uh, Paige Pratko also, uh, you know, a, a list of about 10 people that I think are doing amazing work in the field of um, anxiety disorders, 
all the different manifestations of it, OCD, all of that. And that's what deal um, is also going to be uh, working towards in terms of my own little take on it and how it was helpful to me. And I have found it helpful in working with a lot of people. So what does it mean to decide, evoke, allow, and live? So to decide means that at some point, regard, re, re, you know, when you're dealing with a nervous system problem, you're dealing with disordered anxiety, you're dealing with a sensitization, a nervous system that's on a hair trigger response. We're talking about the amygdala and our limbic system being on high alert and, and perceiving danger where there is none and sending false alarms. This is where, you know, we become, we get afraid to leave our homes. We can become agoraphobic. We can, you know, um, you know, benign things become kind of terrifying when we're on a hair trigger response. And this can, when your limbic system and your nervous system is, is, is frazzled, when it is oversensitized, overheated, whatever you want to call it, and it's throwing off these false signals, these can come in all different forms. For some people, they come in the form of very strange, disturbing thoughts. For other people, they come in the form of physical sensations that are, that are, you know, kind of intractable and feel like they're not going to go away. For other people, they come in the form of like feelings of dread or doom or gloom. Um, and so feelings, thoughts, sensations, urges, images, all of these things are fair game for a nervous system that's highly sensitized. But what happens is it's a bad game of whack-a-mole and you end up chasing things. And so you could have 50 different manifestations physically, mentally, cognitively, um, emotionally, um, when you're dealing with this nervous system, anxiety disorder, whatever you want to call it, um, you can have all kinds of symptoms, right? And so what happens is you start chasing the symptoms. You start trying to fix the symptoms, trying to get to the bottom of the symptoms, and it's like whack-a-mole. You get to one and another one pops up, and you get to one and another one comes up, or you just keep hammering away at one and it's just getting worse. Part of that is because you've not, you, you're, you're kind of, you're out there at the leaves, you're not at the root of the problem. And so just the, the, the D in deal is to decide. It is to make a conscious decision that I now realize that I have a hypersensitized nervous system that is sending off all sorts of misfires and flares and false alarms in the form of all of these symptoms. And they all have to go in the same bucket. I can't spend my day chasing symptoms. I've got to decide that I know this is anxiety, I know this is a highly sensitized nervous system, and I'm putting it in that bucket, okay? So once you do that, then there's still something you have, and there's more to, to go, and that's the EAL that we're going to talk about. But it's important to decide, because what happens is a, a new symptom comes flying in, and all of a sudden we think, oh my God, what is this? Do I have, am I having a heart attack? Do I have cancer? Do I have a brain tumor? Um, you know, um, you know, why are my hands going numb? Oh my gosh, is, what is this a sign of? Oh, my eyes are blurry. Oh my gosh, what does that mean? Um, I, was, I feel faint. What is that about? Um, I'm having this weird thought about my family. What does that mean? Am I a bad person? I can't stop thinking this thing. I have this terrible image of hurting somebody. All, I mean, it can be a litany of things. And so, again, we've made this decision, nope, we're not going to look at the million different manifestations of it. We're going to look at the one problem. We're going to go up to the level of the problem. Or if you think about it like a tree with leaves, we're going to go down to the level of the problem. We're going to be at the root rather than at, and, and, and at the core and the trunk, rather than in all the different leaves. The leaves are the 50, 100 different manifestations that it can take. Once you've decided, nope, it's all going in that bucket, Okay, now we've now what are we going to do? Okay, we always want to have something to do, right? Normally, um, this might lead to taking medication or, you know, doing some mantra or employing different techniques, breathing techniques, mi you know, mindfulness meditation, um, tapping, chanting, all kinds of things, right? Grounding, not all bad things, all good things. But when you're doing it to get rid of something, in the realm of, of the nervous system, it doesn't work that way. The nervous system works in a counterintuitive way. So we've decided we've got a sensitized nervous system. That's why we're having all of these problems. Now we're going to E. We are going to evoke an attitude of irrelevance. This is really hard, right? Totally counterintuitive. When you feel like crap, you know, we are not taught to ignore the fact that we feel like crap. But when you realize that what you're getting bluffed by are very tired, sensitized nerves, creating these disordered anxieties in the different ways that it manifests, 
we then have to, because we've made that decision, we have to learn to evoke an attitude of irrelevance. Oh, well, instead of, oh, shit. You know, oh, well, instead of, oh, my God. And it, sometimes, it's, sometimes we have to practice this 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 times a day. I'm not being hyperbolic when I say that. When you are really in the weeds with this, it is like you know, a scratch in the record. You have to keep putting it back, keep putting it back. And you're not fighting it. You're just simply reframing it. I know what this is. I made the decision. I'm going to leave it alone. I know what this is. I've made the decision. I'm going to leave it alone. And at the same time that you're evoking this overall attitude of irrelevance, which is our goal, you're, you're, you're going to sometimes need what we call little prompts, little non-engagement responses. And what I mean by that is, like, for example, mine might have been, let it burn. So I would remember I made a decision that my brain and nervous system are misfiring, and my little prompt is, let it burn. So all that is, is it's a, it can't be some big monologue. It's one little tiny prompt that reminds me I've already decided what this is. I've already decided what I'm going to do, nothing, and I'm going to leave it alone. So here's my decision. Here's my evoking a, non, an engage, uh, a non-engagement attitude, an, an attitude of irrelevance, along with the non-engagement response of let it burn, leave it alone, drop the rope, drop the mic, step away. It could be anything, and it, you have to kind of come up with your own, and that can sometimes be challenging, and working with a coach can sometimes help finding your own little non-engagement response. At the same time that you're doing this, you're allowing the thoughts, feelings, sensations, urges, images to be there because the goal is not to fight them. It's not to suppress them. It is not to rationalize with them. It is not to engage them in any way, not through avoidance and not through rumination. Those are the two main compulsions we tend to get into is we tend to start avoiding things, right? Um, oh, I had a panic attack at that restaurant. I don't want to go back there. Or, oh, I felt funny the last time I drove. I better not drive. We start avoiding, okay? We don't want to avoid and we don't want to ruminate. Rumination is just that spinning of that mental wheel. Oh, why was I thinking that? What did that mean? That must have relevance. Oh my gosh, what does this say about me? What does this say about my partner? What is, boom, boom, boom. It's, it's the difference between rumination and problem solving. Problem solving has a beginning, middle, and an end right? It, it's actionable. Rumination just is literally chewing the cud and going over and over. So we're going to allow the thoughts, feelings, sensations, images, urges to be there in all of their distressing signals because we're not trying to stop the fire alarm. We're trying to remember, oh, it is a fire alarm. It's a false alarm. There is no fire and I've got to allow that, I've got to allow that fire alarm to ring until it decides to go off. I can't actually make it turn it off myself. But the more I sit there and stare at it or get freaked out by it, the more I'm actually going to be feeding that fire. And I'll talk about that in another video. So deal. Decide that it's an anxiety disorder. Decide it's sensitization. Evoke an attitude of irrelevance and evoke your non-engagement response. Let it burn, leave it alone, drop the mic, drop the rope. And then allow the thoughts, feelings, sensations, urges, images to be there while you L, live your life. This is the most important, this is just as important, if not the most important piece. And the reason why is because the part of our brain that is responsible for that fear response that is telling us we're in danger and therefore it's causing all kinds of things. You know, we're having a heart palpitation and then boom, the, 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 the misperception is you're in danger, you're in danger, you're in danger. That's your limbic system misfiring. Then it's gonna send more cortisol, more adrenaline to the system, which is gonna keep you in a state of palpitation. It's gonna st keep you in a heightened state. So, that part of our brain, the limbic system, and specifically the amygdala, um, is very loyal, but it's very dumb, okay? And all it does is watch you. So if you start having heart palpitations and you take to your bed and get online and start scrolling, doom scrolling through, you know, different things to find out, oh my God, what is this? And, you know, your brain's like, oh my gosh, look, Jen's scared. She's in bed. Uh, she didn't go to the concert. She didn't go out with her family. She canceled her, she didn't go to work today. She canceled her plans. I must be onto something and boom, it sends you more. So it's watching you. Your limbic system 
only speaks the language of behavior. It doesn't speak, hey, limbic system, calm down. It's just a false alarm. You can say that. That's great. It's true. But the limbic system doesn't speak that language. It watches you. So if you respond with rumination, if you respond with panic, if you respond with avoidance, it's going to say, wow, I must have been right. I was right to send up that false alarm. I was right to panic about that weird symptom. You know, we get tinnitus. Oh my gosh, is this ever going to go away? Is it ever going to go away? It will go away when it's ready for it to go away. But the more that you sit there and stare at it, and avoid your life because of it, or curse it and focus on it, become so inward focused, the more we're locking this into place because we're feeding that system that's already malfunctioning, that threat response system, our fear system, our amygdala, our limbic system. We're feeding it um, adrenaline and cortisol as we're, as we're sending it danger, danger responses. Oh my gosh, this is terrifying. Oh my gosh, I'm never going to be okay. So here's the deal. The deal is decide, evoke, allow, and live. And you can't just do one of them. You got to do all of them. And it's not a perfect thing. It's something you practice. We get good at what we practice, right? If you've been dealing with an entrenched in panic or DPDR or weird intrusive thoughts and OCD type uh, situation for a long time, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time of you deciding that you know what it is. You don't have to figure it out anymore. You're going to evoke an attitude of irrelevance. You're going to practice that non-engagement response. You're going to allow the symptoms to be there without fighting or avoiding. And you're going to live your life because you're going to be showing that loyal but dumb part of your body that's, that's misperceiving danger. Look, you know, people in danger don't go to the grocery store. People in danger don't sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream or a salad right? So every time you are living your life, talking on the phone to a friend, people that are, you know, fighting for their lives aren't probably having a conversation with a friend. That brain is watching and it's saying, okay, Jen doesn't seem to be scared of this anymore. Doesn't mean it's going to go away right away. And it doesn't mean it's not going to morph into something else and test you. And when your system is that sensitized, Claire Weeks would talk about let time pass. And that's an enormous piece of this, you know, that I would say that wraps around this entire piece of deal that, you know, this isn't something one and done. You don't employ this acronym once and it's over. You let time pass while you are employing this acronym deal. And what does that mean? Well, it means something different for each person. Claire Weeks herself spent over six months in a sanatorium being treated for what they thought was TB because she had really bad heart palpitations. She never had TB. And it wasn't until they finally gave up on her and released her that she ran into a, 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 a war veteran who said, well, look, let me teach you about this. You, you've gotten so inwardly focused about your palpitations, Claire, that you're keeping them alive. You've got to leave them alone. Make them irrelevant. Live your life and stop paying attention to it. And they didn't go right away, right away. I think it was many, many more months before Claire got a respite from that. But employing deal while you allow time to pass because you're living your life, you're not putting your life on hold for these symptoms. I hope this was helpful, guys.